Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to a fantastic, amazing episode of Radically Loved. I am your host today. This is actually Tessa Tovar speaking. I'm not sure if you can tell that my voice is slightly different than Rosie Acosta's. You're a magnanimous host. She will be back next week. I am just filling in and I'm so excited to fill in because we have an amazing guest for you today. We have Sarah Fay, PhD, MFA on the show with us. She writes for many publications, including the New York Times, the Atlantic, Time, and the Paris Review. She's the recipient of the Hopwood Award for Literature and Grants and Fellowships from Yaddo, the Mellon Foundation, and the McDowell Colony, among others. She's also on the faculty at Northwestern University and the founder of Pathological and also the author of the book Pathological, The Movement. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. As I was saying, I love the show. So I'm just totally honored to be on here and and happy to be here. So we're so excited to have you. I can't wait to dive into this conversation. I think this is such a salient topic and it's so close to my heart. I have um, a sort of personal story with um, mental health running in my family and a whole history of what that means for me as a person growing up and feeling like, gosh, am I struggling with the same kind of diagnoses? Um, Or is that a self-fulfilling prophecy as you talk about in your book as well? And so, yes, where should we start with this? I'd love to hear about your origin story because that's very true to, you know, this path of being misdiagnosed, what was it, six times with six yeah. different... So will you tell me a little bit about that? Where do you want to start with that? Yeah, so um, so my book is Pathological, The True Story of Six Misdiagnoses. And I want to qualify the term misdiagnoses. The reason why I chose that for the book is because I was diagnosed with six different mental disorders starting when I was 12. So at the age of 12, I was uh, diagnosed with anorexia. Then in my 20s, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and then major depressive disorder. In my 30s, I was told I had obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, then attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. And then in my 40s, I was finally told that I had bipolar disorder. So when I say misdiagnosis, we tend to think, okay, we were, and this is what I thought, which was we're looking for the right diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I found out once I reached this point where I was finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I was in crisis. I was suicidal. I hadn't been able to live independently for five years. I'd been living with my mother and I was in my forties. So by the point I'm at, you know, I'm at this crisis point and I finally learned that the mental health diagnoses that we receive aren't as solid solid as I thought they were, certainly not as solid as a physical diagnosis that you might get in physical medicine. So like diabetes, someone can show you a blood test and say, see, you have diabetes. But I didn't realize, wait a second, no, no one could have, no one actually said, showed me, yes, here's ADHD on this x-ray. You can see where you're broken in this way and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, By the time I got there, what I started to realize was not that I was misdiagnosed in the sense that eventually we, you know, I thought we were going to find out what the true diagnosis is, but it's more that all mental health diagnoses that we receive are misdiagnoses. They all are because the definition of a misdiagnosis isn't just that it's incorrect, but that it's inaccurate or inadequate. And what I found and what I discovered, um, I can tell you the story. So basically, you know, and I talk about this in the book, but 
as I said, I was in crisis, suicidal. I was um, had had a falling out with my psychiatrist. I was almost out of medication. He wouldn't refill my prescriptions because I wanted to stop seeing him. It's all in the book. <laughs> He's the villain. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, you know, my family was incredible through this whole thing. I really pushed them away and isolated as many people listening. If you have anyone with mental illness in your family, you can relate to this. The families are the heroes. My family is the hero of my book, but my, I didn't have any of this, uh, you know, I, what I needed. And my sister swept in and found a psychiatrist for me. I went to see him. And after the 30 minute consultation, I waited for him to proclaim, yes, you're bipolar or no, you actually have yet another, a seventh diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so I waited and he looked at me and he said, I don't know what you have. And like my whole world changed and it was freezing cold in Chicago. It was a polar vortex. And I remember leaving his office and walking down Chicago Avenue and the whole world looked different. Like it was crisper, it was harsher, but I thought, wait, someone just told me the truth. <laughs> you know, like no one has told me, wait, we don't really know a lot about these diagnoses. We're dealing with the brain, which is a total mystery. And then what is the mind? We don't even know what the mind is. So we're really, you know, just approximating when we give you a diagnosis. We're just doing our best to get you the treatment that you need. And I didn't know any of this. So that's where misdiagnosis comes from and where the title of the book comes from, because inevitably there are going to be approximations when you get a mental health diagnosis. Um, whereas I thought ADHD is this thing, it's proven, it's scientific you know, major depressive disorder. It's, it's, you know, I pictured people in lab coats, like discovering it, you know, and that's just not the way it is. And I had no idea. Wow. What a journey. Uh, yeah. From the age of 12 up to, you know, into your forties, I can only imagine the, uh, the amount of frustration that, that must have built, um, and just kind of a sense of almost hopelessness and don't let me put words in your mouth, but, um, Thank you for sharing and for writing about this because even I'm I'm already learning new things. I didn't realize that these were not necessarily things that you could, you know, really truly prove that you have. Much like that's a great analogy on an X-ray. Um, it's not necessarily like ADHD can be shown to. Uh, be diagnosed in that way. So very interesting. And I, I know I just threw a lot at you and your listeners must be, there are probably people in their cars, like stopping their cars right now, <laughs> listening to yeah, this. Tell us more. So, because I, I, I just want everyone to know when I found this out, it was like, you know, it wasn't just that my world looked different, but it was like someone had pulled the earth out from under me. I had identified yeah. so closely with my diagnoses that they were very much my identity. Um, so the idea that, wait a second, these aren't, stable categories, you know, yeah. that they aren't really what I thought they were, um, was really shocking to me. So if anyone's listening and feels that way, I absolutely understand. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Well, so I'm curious what happened next, you know, this initial meeting with the psychiatrist who actually told you the truth. And then it seemed like, um, a sense of clarity, albeit kind of stark and, and cold. What was your next step after that? So because I had, you know, I had a PhD, which I'd managed to get through a PhD program. Um, so research was just something I geeked out on. It was just sort of a um, thing that I did that I enjoyed that I loved. And even though I was in crisis, and I was really fragile, although I don't love that word, I really was um, just sort of barely holding it together research became my lifeline. And so I started, re I decided I'm going to learn everything about mental health diagnoses. I'm going to learn the entire history of psychiatry. I'm going to know more than anyone should know. And I, and I did, and it was really disheartening the more I sort of peeled back the layers, but where I got to was that that truth, understanding the diagnosis, diagnoses that I had received and that what mental health diagnoses are and what they aren't, became now I see it as a very good thing. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to disconnect a bit. I had over-identified with my diagnoses. I had made them so much a part of me that I was bipolar. I didn't have bipolar disorder. It was me. Mm -hmm. And that's not um, a place where healing can happen. At least it wasn't for me. And again, this is just my experience, but having that distance and knowing, okay, 
the diagnoses we receive are useful because we use them. They're a way for my psychiatrist who even the one who said, I don't know, he did eventually come up with a diagnosis. I don't know what it is. I do know he's changed it twice since I've started seeing him, but I don't want to know what my diagnosis is because I'll, I'll over identify with it again. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, they are useful. They're a way for um, clinicians to get us treatment, to try to get us, whether that's medication or meditation, it's going to be different for each person. But so they are signposts, they're designations, they're kind of like terms that we use. But I saw them as, you know, they were me. And and that, again, for some people, diagnoses are a huge relief. Mm-hmm. Um, there is an example where, um, you know, autism is a great example of a diagnosis that's very empowering. That community is so bolstered by their diagnosis. They get resources for their diagnosis. They're proud of it. They create terms like neurodiversity. You know, I mean, they just really, that's a very positive diagnosis. Um, so there are examples where a diagnosis can be a good thing. Um, but for me, it just wasn't. It just like you said, it was entire, my situation was hopeless. By the time I was told I had bipolar disorder, I thought I'll never hold a full-time job. I'm going to file for disability. I'll never be in a long-term relationship. I'm going to die 10 years early, likely by suicide. And I'll spend the rest of my life cycling in and out of mania and depression. So like, that's where my diagnosis got me. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, that was just my experience, but yeah. Wow. Uh, so I'm curious for anyone listening who identifies with this kind of journey, how would, how would they go and speak to their doctor, um, when they are handed a diagnosis that maybe it resonates, maybe it doesn't. Is there any sort of language or questions you would recommend a person start using? Yeah, I I founded Pathological the Movement because Pathological the Memoir is, you know, it's a memoir. So it's really my story. Although I weave in all the information I wish I'd had so that I could give people that knowledge base and that the power to be able to have a conversation with your mental health professional. I didn't even know enough to have a conversation about a diagnosis with my mental health professional. So that's in Pathological the Memoir. But I started Pathological the Movement, which is a public awareness campaign in order to give people more actionable steps, kind of like what you're ta- what you're talking about. Um, and I've been so lucky to have an amazing advisory board of, you know, some some really seminal figures in psychiatry and also in um, academia to guide me because I'm not a mental health professional and I'm not a doctor. So I really wanted that guidance to be sure that I was giving people exactly the right information. Um, And people can go to pathological.us and that they'll find all of this. But there are just four facts that we want to give people. So it's not even that you have to do anything necessarily or say anything, because I think we have a really hard time questioning our doctors. I know that I do. I'm really like, you get a white coat in front of me and I'll do whatever they say. (laughs) So so I just, you know, we understand that. And, And I wanted to, you know, give people something that they could just know for themselves and having that knowledge levels the playing field. I mean, it's just totally different, even if you don't say anything about what you know. But anyway, the first fact that we give people is that mental health diagnoses are just designations that a clinician uses to get you the treatment you need. Like, Mm -hmm. that's it. Like, knowing that is so different than thinking, wow, this person just found out that I I am bipolar, you know, or that my 15-year-old daughter has depression, and believing that she'll have it for the rest of her life, which by the way, is not true. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so then the fact, the second fact that we give people is that it's recommended that you get a second opinion. That is a luxury, but I spent 25 years in the mental health system and no one ever told me to get a second opinion <laughs> ever. And so the other thing that's happening a lot, and this was my experience, which may resonate with people, is that five of my six diagnoses came from my GP. 
It came after an annual visit of 15 minutes. It was my primary care physician, you know, slash family doctor. My first diagnosis came from my pediatrician. So these are not people trained in psychiatric diagnosis at all. The most get about 32 hours of training in psychiatric diagnosis or psychiatry in their residency um, total. So that's like binging on a few seasons of Grey's Anatomy. You know, I mean, like that's not a lot of training. Um, so knowing that just that getting a second opinion is absolutely your right. You also don't have to tell the clinician that you're getting a second opinion. Most insurance companies will cover it, but you should check first, of course. Um, and then, you know, if you do see a GP and I know what it's like not to have insurance. So if getting a second opinion isn't an option financially and you get one from a GP, you can ask your GP to consult with a psychiatrist and confirm the diagnosis. So you can, you know, ask for that. Um, the third fact is that the chem there is no such thing as a chemical imbalance. That kind of chemical imbalance theory that's still very, very much believed by Americans. In fact, 80% of Americans believe that mental illness is caused by a chemical imbalance. It's, it's not true. Um, that, that theory, which is now called a chemical imbalance myth, was debunked 20 years ago. It's scientifically meaningless. Um, so it started in the 1950s, but it really um, was just a theory and it was never proven true, but it got worked up by the media big pharma, so pharmaceutical companies, it was a great opportunity for them to market their drugs because if we had an easy answer to depression, they could come in and say, here, you know, or an, you know, an easy explanation, here's the remedy for it. I've got this pill. We know it's a chemical imbalance, but we don't know that. It's not, it, that's not the case. Um, and then the fourth fact that we give people is that you can fully recover from a psychiatric diagnosis and you can fully recover from mental illness. I had serious mental illness and I have fully recovered. And I'm writing the sequel to Pathological right now. And it is all about my recovery and how I did that. And, um, you know, again, it's going to be, you know, look different for each person, but we have this idea that when you're told you have ADHD, it's permanent and it's not major depressive disorder, not even schizophrenia. Um, so, you know, uh, just knowing that is so different. It's such a different way to get a diagnosis. So again, just like not necessarily even confronting anyone with this information, but just knowing it for yourself will empower people. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Wow. Gosh. So, um, so then what does the healing journey look like when you, um, have been, pathologizing these diagnoses over the course of most of your life and you receive this new information, is it a combination of um, big pharma? Is it a combination of drugs with daily practices? Um, I don't, you know, I, it, it seems to me like, and I've heard a lot of people talk about how SSRIs or, um, you know, drugs do help get them to a place of stability where life looks better than it did before. Um, and so I'm curious what that journey looked like for you, because I'm sure it's not one size fits all. Okay. Um, will you tell me a little bit about the, the healing part of the process for you? Yeah. And, and a lot of this new book is about like, what is healing? Like, mm -hmm. You know, in, in the term recovery in mental health is actually a little convoluted in that it tends to mean getting to a point where you're still living with mental illness and you're just managing your symptoms. And I wanted to get to a place where I was actually healed. And one thing I'm, I'm dealing with in the book is like, okay, do I call myself cured? Do I call myself healed? Do I call myself recovered? Like what word do I even use? Because we don't even have this word yet. We, we don't talk about it enough, um, but you're absolutely right that it's going to be different for each person. Along, I mean, my situation was, I mean, I don't know if it was different from other people's, but it's certainly different from the stereotype of a psychiatric patient in the sense that when I was 12 and told that I had anorexia, they weren't putting anorexics on, um, or people with anorexia on, um, Psychopharm uh, psychotropic drugs. So I wasn't 
put on medication, I received Valium for generalized anxiety disorder in my um, 20s, but I didn't really go on medication until I was in my 30s. And so that's um, a little bit different. I will say that once I was on medication, the kind of um, pattern that a lot of people experience, which is being put on medications, dosages changing on and off different ones. And eventually I was put on so many different medications and taken off so many different medications, I lost track. Um, So that definitely happened. Like once you're in the medication kind of world, it tends to move very quickly, but I'm not anti-medication. I'm still on medication. Um, As you say, said, um, medication's tricky. I mean, I tried to go off it. I thought that was a sign of healing and my withdrawal symptoms were so awful and so horrific that I almost died. I'll never try it again. I shouldn't say never, but it's unlikely. And I ended up, um, this wasn't when I was going through my healing process, but I ended up speaking with, um, and he's become a colleague and a friend, but Thomas Insel, who was the former head of the National Institute for Mental Health, someone I respect so greatly. And um, he and I were talking about this and I said, you know, and he's got a new book called Healing that's really wonderful. I recommend for anyone to read, but he's talking about how we will collectively go from mental illness to mental health together as a, as a country. And one thing we were talking about was I said, you know, I'm still on medication, so I can't be healed. Like I can't obviously say I've healed. And he said, no, 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 no. That's not how it's going to work. You know, everyone's going to be different. And he uses this analogy, which I love. And I told him I stole it for the book. (laughs) It's like completely the, the metaphor for my new book, but he describes Uh, mental illness and especially like any kind of psychosis or psychotic break or suicidality, it's like breaking a bone. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this, but when in physical medicine, when a bone heals, the point of the break is actually the strongest part of the bone. That becomes the strongest part of the bone. And I just love that because I feel so strong. And people with mental illness are the strongest people on this planet. We're treated as weak. But to be in that struggle, you have to be very strong. Um, And I think anyone who's listening who's been touched by this feels that. Um, It can make you feel weak, but that's different. And and one thing I feel is, you know, sometimes bones don't heal right. And that's going to happen to people. Um, And then bones are going to heal differently. And some people are going to have a limp for the rest of their lives. And some people are going to be in chronic pain and take, you know, pain medicine or whatever it might be. So again, looking at healing is going to look different for everyone. And so medication or this idea that you can't be healed until you're off medication is misleading. And that's not the case for me, but all along the way, I tried everything. I mean, I know you and Rosie are both, you know, very much devoted to yoga and other practices. And I practiced yoga for 20 years. I actually got to study with Thich Nhat Hanh at Plum Village. I was with Byron Katie. I worked at her school for three years. You know, I mean, I, like I did everything. <laughs> I felt my inner body with Eckhart Tolle, like I did it all. <laughs> so and, and, you know, none of it worked for me. Um, and I think that's part of where medication comes in. I think, you know, many doctors will, t- or many, you know, mental health professionals will tell you that psychotropic drugs are best used short term, as you said, to get you to a place of stability. I went on them, I've been on them for 12 years. So the chances of me going off them are unlikely because my body is dependent on them. Mm -hmm. But there's no question that at that time I had tried, I ate well, I exercised, I was doing everything I could before going to medication as, you know, a possible answer or treatment. And so that medication is just necessary for some people and it can be highly beneficial for some people. So, but this is all to say, I mean, there's no question. And and this is something I outlined in the book is the things that I did, you mentioned daily practices and the things that I did, there are a lot of daily practices that I do um, to keep myself steady and well, um, not because I have this lingering mental illness or diagnosis, but just because I'm a human yeah. oh, <laughs> in a yeah. human with a human mind. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So, yeah. 
Hi, friends. I want to share my latest discover with all of you. Listen in as I guarantee this is the hottest super nutrient packed new product to boost your brain and overall well being on the market. Okay, hear me out. As soon as I tried this product, I became a super fan of it and I was just blown away with the immediate results. I felt focused, my mind was clear. It just doubled my mental performance. It became my go-to routine for productivity, immune support, and even healthy and glowing skin. I mean, who doesn't want healthy and glowing skin? This product was developed after long years of research by most of the advanced brain chemists and formulator today. You probably have heard about the superpowers of mushroom extracts and collagen. So guess what? The product I wanna share with you today contains the most hyper-concentrated forms of four of the best health-boosting mushrooms, lion's mane, chaga, cordyceps, and reishi, collagen, and Peruvian cacao. This magic in a jar is called Collagenius. I mean, it's brilliant. When you combine the cultivating powers of the four mushrooms mentioned here with the various benefits of collagen, it is truly the most effective way to energize your brain and your body. It's genius, it's delicious, it's effective. All you have to do is you can add it to your coffee, put it into your matcha, or you can mix it with water. The smooth chocolatey drink will definitely find its way into your daily routine. And the most important thing is that it will fuel your brain and body with all day energy without any jitters or crashes. So if you struggle with brain fog, have difficulty focusing, and you want to repair your brain in the most natural way, don't wait and check out this product today. It just launched and I believe it will be sold out soon. So don't wait to check on it until like after you've listened to the podcast. Do it now. All of these links are always in the show notes. So if you just go to the info button wherever you're listening to this or watching this on YouTube, just click the link. It's www.newtopia.com forward slash radically loved genius and use the promo code radically love 10 during checkout to save 10%. And that 10% goes a long way. Let me tell you, Newtopia, the company which makes Collagenius is so confident that you're going to love this product. They will offer 365 days money back guarantee. And I guarantee those two guarantees in one, that it won't be the case for you. Again, the special link is www.newtopia.com forward slash radically loved genius and use the code radically loved 10 during checkout to save 10%. Do it now. Your brain will thank you for it. That's www.newtopia.com forward slash radically loved genius and use radically loved 10 during checkout. I think that's so important to point out. I mean, we all need these, Rosie and I talk about it all the time. You're right about our daily practices. And they, and it's not to say that we do them because we're sick in some way, but because it keeps us well, it's preventative medicine for me. Yeah. And I notice that when I don't have my daily practice, I'm I'm very much feeling out of balance and I'm much more likely to yell at somebody that doesn't deserve it or to take my anger or aggression out on somebody that is just happens to be in my pathway. And that's not, um, that's not fair for other people, right? It's also not fair for, for me to, to continue to live a life like that. So the daily practices and rituals I think are so important for all of us as, as human beings um, moving through our life together to keep ourselves safe, to keep other people safe, and to make sure that we're showing up with our um, best intention and our best foot forward. Um, so yeah, thank you for saying that. One thing that's changed, and I will say this is a huge shift for me, is before I was trying to like find the solution in yoga or find the solution in eating certain foods. Um, it was like, a really striving or straining for perfectionism yeah. and some sort of like, I mean, I, I think when I was working, you know, doing the work with Byron Katie, I, I truly was aiming for you know, enlightenment. I wanted to be like Katie. I wanted to be able to like spend my life on a park bench. <laughs> I don't know why, but I did. And so, but it was, it it looked like freedom from my mind and, and the emotional and and mental suffering that I was going through. And, and so 
everything I did, all my daily practices were incredibly arduous. They were like really difficult. I did Ashtanga, which is just like torture. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But sorry for all the Ashtangis out there. It was designed for 12 year old boys. Yes, <laughs> you know, like, yes. a reason. That's a challenging so, practice. It is, but everything was really difficult. And, and I think now the difference is my daily practices are really simple like leg lifts in the morning. I don't even know why I do them anymore. It's just to have the ritual. <laughs> I literally like raise my legs 10 times and then the other leg 10 times. I mean, it's just so like, I, I think it was for sciatica at some point, but you know, now I just keep doing it just because it's become a ritual and mm -hmm. it's just a way of like, okay. And that's enough. Yeah. Whereas the, the striving and the needing more and more and more that's died down a lot. Yeah. I want to make sure Rosie requested that I ask a question on her behalf. And I want to make sure I get to that. So I'm going to ask you now, how do we avoid buying into imaginary categories if the moment presents? So I think, you know, we were talking about um, this a bit before the show, yeah. but the imaginary categories that Rosie's talking about refers to, I mentioned Thomas Insull, um, former head of the NIMH, um, he and others have really come out to warn the public about the mental health diagnoses that we receive and that they are scientifically invalid and largely unreliable. So they are these constructs. They are, as I said, they're just place markers. They're just designations, nothing more. Um, so in some ways, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that psychiatry knows a lot more than the public knows. So we're getting these diagnoses and we're thinking, oh my God, these are like, they're totally true, hundred percent true. And, um, they're not. So then, you know, okay, so great. Thanks, Sarah. Like I've gotten a diagnosis and now you're telling me it's, it's fiction or, you know, and this is not something I said, that's something that, um, uh, Stephen Hyman, another former NIMH director, said that he called them fictive categories. But what does that do for us? Not a lot. I mean, it's not necessarily helpful to concentrate on how flawed our diagnoses are. So if you're given a diagnosis, I think it's more about just being careful to look out for yourself. And if you, and I think this is especially true for children and teenagers, mm -hmm. rates of diagnosis have gone way up. They've gone up by almost 30% for anxiety and depression in children between the ages of seven and 18. I mean, to tell a seven-year-old, but I mean, there's no question I was like an incredibly anxious child. So I understand that. But to be given that diagnosis as if it's true, as if it's in you, like how can we explain to each other and to our children and to, you know, young adults, you've been given this label for lack of a better word. I don't love that. But this designation, this kind of like, you know, term in order to get you treatment, that's it. It's not you, it's not in you. It doesn't mean you won't recover. Like that's a very different way of receiving a diagnosis than what we're doing now. So mm -hmm. that's the way that knowing this information is helpful mm -hmm. for everyone um, rather than like making you necessarily question your diagnosis <laughs> or go down a rabbit hole of, especially if it's been a relief to you. I have very good friends who've been diagnosed with depression who were totally relieved by it. Um, because it was an explanation, it made sense to them, it fit, like that's totally valid. Yeah. So I read this statistic um, as I was preparing for this interview, almost one in five people, which in uh, parentheses, 47.1 million in the U.S. have been diagnosed with a mental health condition, which that is a lot. That is a huge amount. Um, and that number increased by about 1.5 million from last year. So with this mounting sense of isolation in our fragmented country right now, right? We're seeing a lot of that. Um, I imagine that more may follow. Um, and what you're what you're speaking to right here is this diagnosis is, is a path to healing or is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about the self-fulfilling prophecy. And I mentioned at the very beginning of our chat that um, I've always had this kind of dialogue in the back of my head about, 
Is it genetic um, and falling into bouts of depression throughout college and a little bit more recently in adulthood and feeling like, well, maybe it's just, you know, because my grandma had it and she was diagnosed with um, schizophrenia in her, I think she was in her 30s. She just had her third kid. And this is back in the 50s, like you mentioned in the 50s, when these diagnoses started to be widely used or it wasn't diagnoses. It was um, the the chemical imbalance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in the 50s, what what did we do with women? We put them into a psychiatric ward and we shocked them. That's what happened to my grandma. Mm -hmm. And she never, ever recovered from that. You know, and she died young. She died much younger than she should have. And so I have this dialogue in the back of my head that it... It, maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know, but at least I feel like I ride that wave of, uh oh, here it comes again. Uh oh, it's almost like this fear of this depression coming to fruition and what that means about me. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about the self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, I think. I mean, you touch on two really great things, which I'd love to speak to. First of all, I'm so sorry about your grandmother and that she went through that. I mean, I had a my grandmother was in and out of psychiatric uh, wards as well. We don't know what it was. She also was an alcoholic. So that complicates issues as many people know. But talking about self-fulfilling prophecies, I mean, one thing I will say that was so important for me is that no psychiatric diagnosis has been proven to be genetic or biological. We just don't have that proof, which makes sense because when you think about it, right, we can't prove depression on an x-ray or brain scan. And even when you kind of see, you know, clickbait media reports of, oh, we found schizophrenia in this brain scan. Well, they might find, let's say, gray matter, more gray matter in the brains of deceased patients with schizophrenia. The problem is, Gray matter can be caused by a lot of things, including smoking and insomnia and all these things that happen to be often uh, other aspects of sort of the lives of people with schizophrenia. Not always, but it can be. So we haven't found that yet. Um, And we probably won't in the sense that when you think about it, if, if, you know, just to give you an example of how these are imaginary constructs. Uh, meaning mental health diagnoses, just to be clear. So, you know, again, I thought they were kind of coming from, you know, a research lab with men in lab coats and, you know, microscopes and Petri dishes or something like I didn't know. And um, so I, you know, that's what I kind of imagined. But in reality, all of our mental health diagnoses come from a book. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, If your eyes just glazed over, mine used to too. (laughs) I'm not sure what it is about that title, but it doesn't. But it's otherwise known as the DSM. And it was started in 1952, because the 1950s were sort of a time for this. But anyway, what happened was it was essentially members of the American Psychiatric Association. And they sat around a table and they came up with various diagnoses. In fact, 128 at that time. And those, and they also came up with what those diagnoses consisted of. Flash forward to 1980, and that's really when our present conception of what a mental health diagnosis is started. And that is when people started saying they're biological, they're genetic, we're going to prove it. We don't have the proof right now, but we're sure they are. And we've been waiting almost 40 years and they still haven't shown us. But um, what happened then was the DSM changed, the book changed. And so what happens now is if you open the book, the DSM, you'll see on the top of the page, uh, mental or uh, major depressive disorder. And then underneath will be a list of symptoms. And to get the diagnosis, a mental health professional will have to check off or a clinician will have to check off five of nine symptoms. Okay. So that's how you get, there's no test. There's no, you know, even, you know, some people think they take a quiz online. That's, that's not a test. (laughs) Um, And so, but this is a story from that time when they were um, creating the 
criteria for major depressive disorder. The man behind it and the man behind that edition of the DSM, his name was Robert Spitzer, a very, I believe, well-meaning individual. Um, But he really pushed what's called the biomedical model, meaning like it's all biology. There's nothing you can do about it. Your mind is this crazy chemical imbalance swamp. Like, you know, just you have to handle whatever you've been dealt. Um, But he was asked, why do you need five of nine symptoms? That's the criteria to receive a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. And he said, it was just consensus. We went around the table and four seemed like too few and six seemed like too many. That's how they came up with the diagnosis. That's the same diagnosis we give today. So that's what we mean about arbitrary and imaginative, uh, you know, imaginary um, categories and constructs and fictive categories and that sort of thing. They really are made up. Um, And again, like, but that's why they can be beneficial and they can be very dangerous when we talk about self-fulfilling prophecies. So if you are over-identifying with a diagnosis, like me, like I did, I was seeing everything as proof of my diagnosis. Every emotion I had, every behavior, every thought, that's proof that I'm bipolar. That must be why I'm bipolar. Yeah, ruminating, mm, racing thoughts. Okay, yeah, this is all confirming it. But it's really just a construct. So why was I doing that? And it made me worse. It made me into someone with bipolar disorder or, you know, that I was bipolar. And so that's where the self-fulfilling prophecy um, can be really dangerous and something to look out for. These are just, they can only, you know, one thing that I really recommend for people is use these diagnoses to benefit yourself, you know, use them. I mean, unfortunately there isn't, I mean, autism has a lot of kind of connotations that are positive. It's often associated with genius. It's often associated, you know, this is not true of course of more severe cases, but it has positive connotations that some other diagnoses don't have. But if you catch yourself using a diagnosis against yourself or to limit yourself or to limit what you're capable of, they're just, they just don't have that power. I mean, they're just not solid enough to do that to yourself. Um, and that's what I wish someone had said to me. But the other thing you brought up, which I think is really important, is awareness, mental health awareness. I actually have an op-ed in the LA Times today. <laughs> it just came out today. Um, but where we're going wrong with mental health awareness and where I see it going awry is it's so focused on diagnoses. Diagnoses are memes. They're all over television. They're all over social media. We self-diagnose on social media. We diagnose each other. Celebrities talk about diagnoses. But without this information that I'm giving right now or that's in my book, and that's really dangerous, why are we so focused on the diagnosis instead of other ways to heal? Like, all right, a diagnosis is, you know, the headline is uh, my diagnoses were a dead end or something, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, But that's it because we tend to start and end with diagnoses. But where do we go from there, right? You go to see someone to get help and you get a diagnosis and you'll get a treatment option and that's it, right? No one talks to us about healing or recovery. Yeah. Well, so on that thread, what does it mean to you to be well? What does that look like? That's what I'm writing. (laughs) That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like what, (laughs) what does that, it's a sneak peek on this. I mean, it's really fascinating because I do think, um, I'm like, I'm a very happy person. I don't love that word because it's so striving. Maybe a better word is content or satisfied or something, but I have so much joy in my life. And part of it was that being so ill and then wanting to be well, I had to really minimize. I had to just say, okay, what's most important to me? So the chapter I was writing today is about my decision to have three areas in my life. Like that's it. There are three areas. I'm not allowed anything else. And they're the most important things in my life. And it's writing, teaching, and my family. And that's it. I'm not a very good friend. Like, I'll just be straight up. (laughs) It's just not my 
focus, you know, like I, I just can only give so much and I only have so much. And I don't know if that's because I had a mental illness, um, or because I'm a human. I don't know. I mean, but there's so much stimulation and there's so much, so large of a demand, especially for like a white middle-class person, you know, I, I'm speaking for myself and from my perspective and I, I you know, I have a lot of privilege and I want to own that. Um, but, you know, from that, there's this kind of ideal in that context of like you travel and you go to brunch and like, you know, I don't even know what we're supposed to do, but like you have hobbies and hobbies are beyond me. Like I'm not having any hobbies, like I'm out. It's just, and so just trying to minimize and, and streamline my life has been, I, I just couldn't, at first I thought it was me kind of healing or like medicine and it's become just a source of joy. It's such a relief that I don't have to do everything and be yeah. everything. Oh, I'm, it's really nice to hear you say that. I, I struggle with that same kind of dialogue with myself about especially being a good friend, because I feel like I put so much, I feel like so many people can identify with this. We put so much pressure on ourselves to have that idyllic best friend or group of friends or, um, and especially speaking from my place of, or my perspective as a woman to have that close girlfriend, like it's expected of me to, to need to go and talk to my girlfriends, to process things, to, um, share my emotions and to, to be able to receive that from them as well. Ideally, it sounds nice to be able to do that, but I haven't figured out how to do it successfully. And I feel like a failure when I, when I think about this social construct of, oh, well, I'm supposed to have this childhood friend that like I go to, to talk to about everything. And yeah, we go to brunch together. Um, (laughs) and it hasn't worked out for me so far. And I'm like, what does that mean about me? I suck at being a friend. Um, so thank you for saying that. And, (laughs) and I'm, I'm thinking about this also from the perspective of, you know, here we are maybe in our forties and our fifties, um, moving towards sixties and thinking about, okay, we've been on this journey of life for a while now. So, I'm I'm curious for you, Sarah, what would you tell your younger self, you know, about, about her current experience as a teenager or a young adult from the lens where you are now? Well, it just like, it makes me so sad for her. I mean, she was just in so much pain. I mean, an interesting way to look at diagnoses. When I was diagnosed with anorexia, I was not eating and I hadn't been eating very much for months. My weight was very low. And I went on an eighth grade class trip and I didn't eat for four days. And when I came back, I couldn't hold down food or water. And my parents rightly took me to the hospital and our pediatrician met us there. He weighed me and he said, she has anorexia. And that was the first time I'd heard the word. I had no idea what it meant. It seemed very dire. You know, I thought I was going to die. I didn't know. But what was interesting was at that same time, my parents were divorcing and I was going to a new high school and I was so sad and I was terrified and had no way to articulate those emotions. And I had a pit in my stomach that made me sick and I didn't want to eat. I did not have the three like kind of signature signs of anorexia, which are um, counting calories, weighing myself obsessively and thinking that I was fat body dysmorphia. But talking about the self-fulfilling prophecy again, when I associated myself with anorexia, I became an anorexic and I started to count calories and weigh myself and see myself as fat. And so it it really did. And again, I was at that really impressionable age and that always sounds really condescending, but you know, to um, that I was forming my identity. So to form your identity around a diagnosis can be really tricky and dangerous, like somewhere on that spectrum. Um, But this is all to say, if I could speak to that younger version of myself, I think, you know, I don't know that she would believe me if I said that it's okay. I was uncomfortable in myself 
all the time. It was interesting because someone asked me, well, do you think you never had mental illness? And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> no, that's not an option. Like you should see my brain then over those 30 years and my brain now I'm a, whole, it's like living in a different brain. I, I just have a completely different mind and I'm trying to figure out why that is and how it, it changed so much. But, um, so I guess it would just be something along the lines of don't read the internet. <laughs> because You're going to get a lot of misinformation and you're going to get a lot of like, fight, you know, learn too much about anorexia, I guess. Um, but also just that, that maybe the diagnosis isn't the answer and that there are answers elsewhere to something mm -hmm. along those lines. Yeah. I love that. It's, it's like opening a door to, um, more possibility, you know, instead of putting yourself into this little box that is very constrictive, it's like you're offering your younger self, um, a way to have a, a wider perspective and explore and, and ask, what does that actually mean? You know, okay. Mm -hmm. Anorexia, what does that actually mean? Okay. What do I do with that? Yeah. Um, I love that. Thank you. So I want to be mindful of your time and um, I'm curious for a last question. What There's so many things in here. There's so many, I personally, my mind is blown. I mean, if you could see my face right now, if you're listening, I'm, I've, Sarah's been watching me have these expressions throughout our conversation of like <laughs> awe and shock and surprise. Um, and, and I want things to really land. And I think this is an episode that probably I'll go back and listen to a couple of times to let it all sink in. And so out of this, I'm wondering, you know, when people pick up the book, when people listen to the conversation, what is one thing that you hope they take away? The main thing is to use our diagnoses for us, not against us, right? So they're there, we use them and that's okay. Like if they're horribly flawed. It's what we have right now. I mean, I, I actually, I mean, I'm not at all anti-psychiatry. I still see the, I don't know psychiatrist. He knows he's in the book. He's fine with being in the book. <laughs> he's, you know, we talk very openly about these things and he's very honest with me. Um, and not every, you know, psychiatrist will be that way, but I'm not at all anti-psychiatry in the sense that they're in a very tough position. We know so little about the brain. There are what, 10 billion neurons. I don't even know how they counted that, but you know, and then, as I said, there's the mind, which we don't even know what the mind is, the brain mind split. So we're asking them to do a lot of work and we're asking them to, you know, kind of like meet a very tall order. And so if we can all come together from that perspective and just know we're, first of all, we're all in this together. We're all want healing and treatment, access to treatment, access to care for those who need it. We all want to relieve mental and emotional pain um, for ourselves or for others that that'll come from knowing the truth about these diagnoses so we don't use them against ourselves and instead can talk about, okay, how can I use this, if not to my advantage, but in a way that it doesn't limit me. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I want. You know, my, my book is really just a cautionary tale of what can happen, especially to a young person who receives a diagnosis and over-identifies with it to her detriment. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sarah, I really appreciate you sharing your story. This is such important work. So thank you for bringing it to us and sharing it with the world. Um, I appreciate your time. It's been such an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, Rosie, for letting me do this interview. <laughs> um, Sarah, we wish you well, and we'll make sure that all of the links and, and um, you know, to the books and the other authors that, that you mentioned will be in our show notes so people can easily find you, follow along with you and your story and get the help that they need as well and, and find those um, that, that healing path for themselves also. All right, Great. everyone. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta.
By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com. <laughs>